Hello, and welcome to The Nonprofit Show. We are so glad that you joined us today, or maybe you joined us another day via our recording. But today we're excited to have you here, and we're also excited to have our friend Jack Alato, CFRE, very involved with CFRE, and also serves as a trainer at Fundraising Academy with National University. Jack's joining us for two consecutive days and both days about handling donor objections. So today is part one, tomorrow is part two, and you are going to want to join us for both of these conversations. So before we jump into the deep end with you, Jack, we of course need to remind our viewers and our listeners across the globe who we are. So hello to you, Julia. Julia Patrick is the CEO at the American Nonprofit Academy. And I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd and CEO at the Raven Group. Julia and I have been together since March of 2020, providing this content. Thank you to our amazing sponsors that have allowed us these conversations each and every weekday with esteemed guests like the one we have with us today. So I do want to say thank you to our presenting sponsors that include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. So these companies, they not only invest here in our conversations, but they also have a representative like Jack of, of um, Fundraising Academy joining us every single month to provide some insight and information about what's going on in our sector, again, around the globe. So it's really great to have these leaders from many different areas, talk to us about what they're seeing, what's trending, what they can forecast. So today we are excited, but if you missed any of this episode or you want to go back to our previous episodes, because maybe you're joining us and thinking, I had no idea that you've produced nearly 800 episodes. Well, now you do, and you can find them on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Vimeo, as well as YouTube. And for those of you that enjoy podcasts, Go ahead and queue us up wherever you stream your podcast as well. Again, nearly 800 of our episodes and probably over 700 unique guests. So those are the thought leaders that have joined us. So today we have Jack Alato, CFRE, trainer at Fundraising Academy. Welcome back, Jack. I'm glad to be here. And what a great topic to be uh, spending my Wednesday morning talking about. Yes. You know, Jack, it's exciting because this content, and you can see my book very well worn, comes from Fundraising Academy's actual textbook that is used. And today we're going to drill into and drill down through, I guess we should say, handling donor objections, which I think for most of us, it's like the terror quotient. You know, it's the <laughs> thing that gives us the most fear. And it seems like it's a bouncing ball. So Let's get into the framework of what an objection is, and then you have four main areas. But first, like, help me understand why I shouldn't be afraid of an objection. Well, that's a great question, because in the cost selling cycle, we look at objections not as a no, but as a sign of interest. Your donor or your prospective donor is giving you an objection. Not They're not saying no. They're saying, tell me more. And they are in the process, when they come up with an objection, they're in the process of eliminating any remaining concerns. And you, when you, uh, when you answer this objection, you are moving them closer to saying yes. The other thing that I think is really important that we should understand as it relates to objection. When a donor uh, gives you a concern or an objection, that might be something that they are hearing out in the community. They are reflecting some concern or objection, and it's really important for you as a fundraiser and for your wider organization to understand what that objection is about. Yeah. And when you uncover their concerns, then definitely you're going to be able to answer those concerns and move closer to that yes, that is really what you want to hear. I appreciate that, Jack, because I know being in the fundraising seat, I have had that same fear of, 
what if this donor, what if this organization, what if whomever I'm asking does say no? Like we're counting on this, you know, or we've maybe even allotted some of this into um, into our budget or forecasted that, right? So, so talk to us about the types because you have four here on the screen. And for those of you listening, I'll, I'll share those four and Jack's going to talk about them. But the first one we have, and you're going to dive into is the organization or cause and then we have the fundraiser, which I'm presuming is the actual person, uh, the aversion to a decision and gift objection. So talk to us about these four. So uh, an objection to your organization or your cause may be something like, I don't really believe that your organization is run efficiently, or I have issues with how your organization uses its gifts. They okay. may, it may be that this cause that you are presenting to them is not a priority for them, or they may prefer to give to another organization working in this same space mm -hmm. as it relates to a fundraiser. And let's face it, as much as we love each other here on the nonprofit show, and we know that we're really wonderful human beings, the fundraiser, uh, a donor might object to a fundraiser. Here's the thing that I typically see as it relates to objecting to the fundraiser. They're saying you're not prepared. Or they may be saying you're not listening to me. I'm telling you something and you're not listening to me. And all of us have seen this in a fundraiser. You are pitching me too aggressively. Or finally, I don't really like you. Or you're not the right person to be asking me for this gift. And, you know, Jared, we talked about that earlier. Sometimes you have to have the right person who's built that relationship with that individual or that individual knows who's actually doing the asking. They may have an aversion to a decision. Here's what you're going to hear when they have an aversion to a decision. They may say, the next time you're in this area, please stop by and, and let's chat again. They're, they're averting making a decision. Or they may say, I want to think it over. Or the third thing that I've heard as an objection is, I really need to discuss this with my spouse. Yeah, right. That's that they they want they want somebody to help them make that decision. Yeah. And finally, the gift objection is I can't afford this. You're asking me for too much, or I'm all tapped out right now. Sometimes an objection may just be the opposite. You're asking me for too little. Mm -hmm. You haven't really gone out and qualified my gift and understand my ability to make a gift. So we don't want to insult people by asking for too much, but we also don't want to uh, insult them by asking for too little. The first time I heard that, Jack, I thought there's no way someone be offended by asking for too little, but I have seen it happen. Right. And it, and it is insulting for individuals that have been engaged. You know, they are prime for the ask. You've done the cause selling education model with them. You're at this, you know, the time of asking the solicitation and they're like, that that's it. <laughs> How does this yeah. make a difference? So I appreciate you bringing that angle to the conversation. Yes, I actually have experience with a donor saying, why did you ask me for so little? Wow. You know, it's almost like you asked me for 500. Why, and, and he actually said this to me. Why didn't you ask me for 5,000? Yeah. So I hadn't qualified the donor, which is a key part of the cost selling cycle. Make sure we understand their ability to give, whether it's too much or too little. Yeah. So, so Jack, when we start this conversation and you give us these four objection types, organization or cause, the actual fundraiser itself, the person itself, aversion to decision, and then the gift objection, do you really feel like every conversation that we have can really be attached to one of these things if we're, if we're having some stress or some something? I mean, really, I we need to understand these four pieces at the beginning so that we can understand how to navigate forward? Yes, I really do think it's really important for us. If you look at the cost selling cycle, during need discovery, during presentation, you're going to uncover things that later on may show up as objections. When we are having the, building that relationship in the cost selling cycle, we are going to find out things about our donors or our prospective 
factors that may come up. It may be, you may be an organization, a social service organization, and your donor, your prospect may be interested in feeding the poor, but not necessarily in housing the homeless. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you go and ask them for a gift around housing the homeless, that's a uh, objection to the cause. Yeah. You, you haven't found, you didn't ask them for the right cause, which was feeding the poor. Yeah. You know, I really think so much needs to go into, you know, really the, the prospecting. And I feel like what I see um, ha or have seen in my career, Jack, is we're always so eager to make the ask, right? We're so <laughs> eager to get the money in and we forget the finessing that goes into the relationship. And I've also heard from organizations where board members or certain leadership don't really value the relationship. Oh, and that just, you know, it really hits home because I've seen so many misses because of that. And so really, you know, coming to this to say, okay, you know, we know exactly what's driving this person to our cause and to know the difference. Is it shelter? Is it food? Yep. Yep. And, you know, I think, I don't know of a successful uh, relationship, uh, uh, fundraising strategy that isn't built on relationships. And certainly our model is really built on relationships, building those relationships. You know, when we're going back to need discovery, we're asking those open-ended questions, you know, what, what motivates you to make a philanthropic gift? If they say I'm motivated because I want to feed hungry children before they go to school, bingo, you got it. Right there. So mm -hmm. it's that all that relationship and, and, you know, and I, you know, I love objections because they tell us and un, uh, uncover for us concerns that that prospect or donor has, and we can answer those concerns. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you something else. If you don't answer an objection or if you don't give them, that objection is going to constantly come up. It's going to keep coming up. It's never going to go away. That's why we have this whole chapter in our book that we use at cost selling about handling objections. So let's let's kind of move into that because you you advise us to anticipate and forestall objections so that we really shouldn't be surprised um, by what what's happening in the conversation. Explain that to us, Jack. So I, anticipating, you know, when you're having that conversation, when you're doing that need discovery and you're getting to know that prospect and that donor, they're going to talk about some things that may come up when you make the ask as an objection. Mm -hmm. They're going to talk about some things that bug them, maybe about your nonprofit or about the community or whatever it is. By anticipating those potential objections, you can prevent future uh, confrontations while showing an objectivity and honesty. Here's a secret. Okay. Taking the time to anticipate objections and preparing your responses will help you feel more confident in your interactions with donors. So anticipating possible objections. And not only do you do this with individual donors, but you may do it with your corporate donors or your foundation donors, talking to your peers, what kind of objections do you hear from this major gift donor, especially if you share that individual or a corporation? What are some of their concerns? And then coming up, writing down those answers to forestall those when they come up. So during your presentation, if I find out that Jared has an objection to an advocacy program we have around homelessness, Someone, I, I've learned this during that need discovery. I might say to her during that uh, presentation, I might say, now, part of our advocacy work is to do this, this, and this. So I have an, I found out what her potential objection might be, and I have forestalled it by addressing it in the presentation. Now, she may still present that, but I have already talked about an issue that she will bring up. And I love the the objection or, you know, the anticipation of the objection. Let me talk to my partner, you know, let me talk to my family and really knowing 
who are the decision makers? You know, I, I love the Madden test, which that is a big piece of fundraising Academy. And you can, you, our viewers and listeners can go back and, and see what that is, but really finding out, you know, who are those decision makers and do the partners need to be there? Do the family members oh. need to be there? Cause we're seeing a lot of multi-generational uh, giving now. And, yeah. and I have certainly been there where it's like, you know, four or five different generations of family members are the ones actually oh. making the presentation or making the decision. And during your need discovery, if you ask that question, Julia, how do you make decisions around making a philanthropic gift? And she says, well, I, I talk to my husband, I talk to my children, we sit down together. Then all of a sudden, I know who has to be in the room mm -hmm. when I am asking for a gift. Right, right. That family unit. Right. Well, and I think it honors the process of that donor investor, too. And it, you said something really interesting from the get go. And I've heard you say this before, Jack, and that is we need to do a better job of listening and understanding what the the ecosystem of that donor investor is so that we can we can get there and, and move through the process to what it is they want to see and they yeah. want to invest in. You know, another thing about objections, if you sat down and uh, I, I think if a donor, every donor has some questions, sure. like tell me more about your work in feeding children before school. Tell me more about how you are housing families, all of those things. And if you answer those questions during that need discovery, during that relationship building, and you you they understand completely what is going on with your program, then you're going to forestall objections. I always say, if I sit down with a donor and they have no objections, I wonder if they really know the programs that I'm pitching to them. Right, right. Are they very informed? Are they, yeah. you know, as informed as we could possibly have done that for them? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It, it also seems too that um, I like the idea and maybe this is just my own concept of having asked for a lot of money th throughout my life in my community. When somebody asks questions, they've been thinking about it as yeah. opposed to I can afford it or I can't simple as that. But, yeah. but when, when somebody has a question, I feel like they're going to be a longer term donor. They're going to be more of a sustainable relationship. Um, and is that just me or do you think that that could be true? Oh, no, I love questions. I love concerns. I love when donors express concerns. I love asking them their opinion. Yeah. What do you think? If they say, you know, I don't really like the advocacy work that your organization is doing with politicians. Okay. I might say to them, how do you think we should approach that? and get their advice. And they may say, well, maybe, you know, you should do it this way. I don't like the strident board member in front of city council. So, so listening to them, getting their advice, you're, what they're doing is they're becoming owners of that process. They're becoming owners and involved in that process of advocacy. I love sharing and asking for advice during need discovery. What do you think about our case for support? What do you think about our approach to ending poverty in the community? What do you think about our, our women's health program at our hospital mm -hmm. or the emergency room services we provide? Whatever the organization is, it's really important. Even in the arts, we might say in a ballet, what do you think about our after ballet um, meet yeah. the choreographer? Right, yeah. Was that effective? Did you enjoy it? Was it fun? Jack, I'm cur curious, do you ever coach or have you yourself ever, you know, asked point blank to the, to the donor, do you have any concerns that would prevent you from making a donation? Oh, like, do you that's, ask point blank? Yeah, that's a good That one. is a great question. Yeah. And, and they will tell you, they will tell you, absolutely, I don't like this or I don't like that. Now, okay. um, the opposite question is that, what are the reasons what, that would bring you to say yes to a gift in a philanthropic organization? I actually like that approach more. They may say something, you know, Jared, when I get all the information, when I look at the financials and when I look at the impact of what donations do for that organization, it 
is really important for me to know that stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which tells you if they're not getting that information, guess what's happening? That they're will not be a concern. Make it. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, our time is running short and I want to make sure that we give due diligence to, you know, the the final point on today's topic uh, when we talk about handling obje objections and you have here, answer the objection immediately. Yep. So tell us about this. So if you know, if, if by responding immediately to an objection, you remove it from the prospect's mind. Okay. And they can concentrate on the rest of the story that you are telling them in your presentation, the big picture, so to speak. This technique of answering the objection immediately shows that you are sincere and that you're listening to them. Mm -hmm. And that's such a key. Really successful fundraisers know how to listen. Answering immediately prevents the prospect from thinking you don't know the answer. Yeah. So I really like answering immediately. Now, there are going to be some times when you don't have an answer and you may have to postpone the answer, uh, the donor's concern or whatever it is. You might need more time to find out the answer. And believe me, in my career, I've gotten questions that were way off in outer space and I had no way to answer them. OK, this technique, uh, you know, when you postpone gives you time to think. But it, do, it shouldn't stop you from continuing to talk about the benefits of your cause and what you're doing. And I'll give you an example of, of this from my own career. Here I was in Northern California working in an organization that had an immigration program. And someone called me up and said, what is your organization doing at the border in Texas for those uh, immigrant children who are abandoned at the border in Texas? I had no answer to that. What I said is I am going to find out what our sister organizations are doing down there in Texas to help those. I think it was four. You probably remember from those 40 children were left at the border. And I promise you, I will get back. But let and so and then I continued with the benefits of our immigration program. Let me tell you about what we are doing with immigrants. And I did. I called up an organization in Texas and I said, what's going on with these 40 children? What can you do? Called the donor back in the meeting and said, here's what our sister organization is doing at the border in Texas. If you want it, make a gift to them. Here's how you do that. Mm -hmm. So I just think it's really important. The other thing is, you know, answering immediately. Don't fake it. Don't say Hey, uh, well, we're doing this. We're sending this, or we're don't make it up. Yeah. Don't get nervous to the point where you think I got to say something here. I've because, seen that happen. Yeah, and me I too. At the end of the meeting, I said I didn't know that was happening, and they said it's not. But I didn't know what else to do, and I thought, yeah. oh my yeah. gosh, <laughs> they get so nervous because they think, oh Lord, what's going to happen? They're not going to make a gift. I have to say something. No, you don't. You don't. You know, Jack, it's better. Better to postpone it than make something up because then you're going to be, they're going to say, this guy is not authentic. This right. guy is not sincere. Right. Yeah. Well, I think, Jack, it gives you an opportunity, a natural opportunity to re-engage because you can say, hey, I told you we were going to follow up and here's what I found out. Can I share this information with you? It just seems like it's actually an opportunity to automatically you know, set up another engagement. You know what, Julia? That's a great answer. I always say when I come on the nonprofit show, you two teach me so much stuff that I've forgotten in fundraising. Oh, wow. That is <laughs> such a good point. How? How? What a powerful point. I yes. am curious. It, do, you, do you say like, you know, let me get back to you within the week, within yeah. the next two weeks? Like, is there a certain sweet spot on timeline? Yeah. I usually like, you know, I'm I'm a 48 hour guy. Okay. Everything happens within 48. I'm going to lose two pounds in 48 hours. I'm going to get back to you in 48 hours. I'm going to grow a head of hair in 48 hours. Some things, and it's just it just says that you care about their concern when you say that when you when you postpone that answer when you answer it immediately that's great and then you can move on. But sometimes you're not going to have the answer, guys. You're just not. So you don't fake it. Go for it. 
Okay, now I have one more question for you before we leave. And this is kind of like a off track in some ways. But if you think back throughout your illustrious career, how often is this occurring? I mean, like 10% of the, the, the meetings that you take where you're to that point more than ask or 5%, 50%. Can you kind of paint a picture for what we yeah. might be able to expect? Yeah. So here's, here's, I think it successful asks 90% of the donors have objections. Yeah. Okay. That's I what I think. And, and, and I'll tell you why, because it's a journey to make a successful ask and they're engaged in this journey. And they, if they're thoughtful donors and not check writers, especially transformational gifts, uh, yeah. they're going right. to gonna talk about objections. Yeah. So I'm going to say, if they don't have objections, there would be no need for us. Yeah. Right. Well, true. Yeah. So we are there to answer their objections, to help them in that journey, to get to yes. Now, yeah. would you say, Jack, that's like a major gift level and above? Anybody, any, Anybody. A, you know, okay. any single body. I mean, you know, I used to get small gifts and they would ask questions they would have objections and the truth of the matter is every single donor mm -hmm. deserves an answer to their objection no matter what it is and believe me I, you know i mean in your career guys you've heard some things that you're like wow i didn't anticipate that objection oh yeah where did that come yeah. yes yes oh, yeah. it's yeah, interesting I mean, and you have to i think you have to like as my mother would say gird your loins to not get yeah. Uh, taken off track that you got to be like okay that's amazing i don't oh. know but i'll come back and not just like melt down because then you've lost that opportunity yeah i i had a donor say to me once you know i he agreed to a meeting with me it was a big trip forty thousand dollar gift and during the course of the, his very first thing out of his mouth is why did you ask for this meeting and i'm like oh. wow I thought it was obvious I want a gift, you yeah. know, but I had to back up and say, you know, I want to explain to you more about what we're doing in the organization. And I didn't anticipate that question. I'm sure you guys have had those. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, this has been so insightful. Um, and just the tip of the iceberg as we move into part two tomorrow. So Jack, thank you for joining both Julia and myself today for this part one of handling donor objections. It's been a lot of fun to do these drill downs with Fundraising Academy. So thank you, Jack. Um, and again, those of you watching and listening, Jack Alato, CFRE and trainer at Fundraising Academy with National University. Jack will be back tomorrow to talk about part two which is also handling donor objections. And as you heard him say, 90% or more than 90% of most donations will have an objection for you as the, the fundraiser or the board member to handle at some point in your career. So thank you for sharing this um, so I don't know, transparently and, and fun. You definitely bring the fun uh, to the conversation. So I really appreciate that. Uh, thank from, you. Yeah. We also want to say thank you to our presenting sponsors that allow us these conversations. So thank you to our friends over at Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller that's celebrating 30 years, nonprofit thought leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, again, yes, where Jack Alato joins us from, also to Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, as well as Nonprofit Tech Talk. These companies, many have been with us from the very beginning. We are so grateful to have their investment in the sector at large. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Please do check them out because they're here for you and your mission. Absolutely. And as we like to remind everyone, our viewers, our listeners, our guests, our co-hosts to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone.